Why does nobody want to sit at the front? <laughs> I don't know. Can't imagine. <laughs> Hello, I'm just testing the volume. Can people at the back hear me? Yes? Is that too loud for anybody? No? Okay. That's fine. Squeezing everybody in. <laughs> Wonderful to see so many of you here. Um, I'm Janet Quigley, PSA President, and um, so thank you all so much for coming to this third lunchtime session for 2019 in our series of um, lunchtime talks um, on matters of interest to our PSA members um, working in the community and public services. So a quick rundown on our emergency procedures in case of a fire, the alarms will sound and we make our way down the stairs um, and across the road um, to the other side of Aurora Terrace. In case of an earthquake, wow, this is going to be difficult, you um, drop cover under the seat <laughs> and wait instructions so that will be interesting <laughs> so we are streaming this session um, live and we'll also post the video on our website afterwards we're very mindful of your privacy and we'll work and work obligations so we will not be videoing the question session um, here we are one week from the government presenting its wellbeing budget and today we're so lucky to be hearing from arguably one of New Zealand's most foremost economists and feminists, Marilyn Waring, on what she thinks of this new approach. 13 years ago, new Marilyn's um, groundbreaking book, Counting for Nothing, was released. Her meticulous economic analysis of how success how the success of the global economy rests on women's unpaid work kick-started a, a critical conversation about GDP as a measure of the nation's success. 30 years on, what's changed? Well, Rob Muldoon is no longer the Prime Minister. <laughs> we still remain nuclear free. And women make up 46 of the 120 MPs in Parliament. And we're about to move to a well-being budget. But... Will women's unpaid work still count for nothing? We look forward to hearing from Marilyn on this perspective. Welcome, Marilyn. Kia ora koutou. Um, what I'm going to try to do in the time is um, not presume that everybody's read 1953 and 1968, all the other versions of some of the history that's really important. So just to try and lay out some of that background, because pretty much none of that has changed, and it's always important to understand that framework if you want to take on <laughs> um, the major arguments. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, unpaid work and how different people have tried to measure it, and whether or not we should be measuring it or trying to capitalise or give it a monetised uh, value and what some of the issues are with that. Um, and then uh, discuss all of that in the framework of what I know about the wellbeing budget. Um, given that I'm not sitting in Treasury, uh, you know, there are some um, challenges for me, however, I am a critical friend. 
of Treasury and I was on the Wellbeing something group. Um, so um, I, I watched some of the evolution of that up until October, November last year. Um, as I go, please, if uh, one of the problems when you're so familiar with material is that I just gloss straight through terms. And so if there's something I say and you think, what on earth does that mean? Please just flag it for me so I can deconstruct. Because if you haven't got it, then some other people won't have either. Uh, so in 1953, um, a man called Sir Richard Stone authored the first of these encyclopedic volumes on something called the system of national accounts. Uh, it was always sold as something that was very important to measure, uh, in fact this appears in the first construction, to measure the well-being of society by way of per capita at GNP at that time and subsequently GDP. This set of rules, which was to be imposed on every country, um, structured something called the boundary of production. You can just envisage this as a line and determined that a certain group of activities would be classed as being economic transactions and another group of activities would not be counted in any way at all. Now the nature of that line, this boundary of production, changes a little for revisions in 1968, in 1993, uh, in the most um, to recent 2008 revisions. But it never challenges what happened in 1953. And when you read the words about why certain uh, work was excluded, it's breathtaking. The first reason is convenience. The next reason is, as long as I can remember this, um, because primary production and the consumption of their own production by non-primary producers is of little or no importance. Okay, so I can see from your body language, you got it, that non-primary producers are all the people who are on the inconvenient side <laughs> of the boundary of production. And essentially this has never changed. Now it is important to know that the boundary of production has always measured things that don't pass through the market. Um, the most obvious one is owner-occupied dwellings. So in establishing a gross domestic product, we pretend that everybody who owns a house actually rents it. And we impute a market value into the accounts for all owner-occupied dwellings. Similarly, easy for me with my heritage, um, you know, when you are sending 50 stock off to the sale and you retain two as a home kill, the home kills are treated as if they went to sale and they're entered in the books for exactly the same value as you uh, receive in the sale because the inputs into them were exactly the same as the inputs into all of those that went to market. Why that is, doesn't all of a sudden become non-primary production is very interesting. Uh, and especially for MPI, I have to get this one in there. Um, so every year we look at, because of the nature of this boundary of production, we look at uh, production of milk from cows, from sheep, from goats and buffalo, all included in our GDP, and the most Im important food of all, breast milk, never appears there because, of course, it's non-primary production. Um, even Joseph Stieglitz now argues this, but we'll get to that in a moment. The reason why I got totally involved with this was when I was chairing what was then called the Public Expenditure Committee. And there was no way ever of proving 
for example, um, that 24-7 carers of people totally dependent on them <laughs> were working. And, and what's more, we're working through holidays at double time, at triple time, at everything else, and receiving, and this was an ACC situation, receiving nothing. And a lot of that happened in a rural constituency. So that started to trigger some of these things for me, and when I first started to ask questions. My first, so the first edition of the book, Counting for Nothing, actually I argued that we should conduct time use studies, great, I'll come back to those in a moment, and that we should estimate the value of the unpaid work and include it in the GDP. When I wrote that book, I was still very fixated by the challenges I had had in a parliamentary environment to try and prove the visibility of things inside a coherent policy framework. So whether that was um, environmental characteristics or whether that was unpaid work, my close association and only recent departure um, from the parliamentary system meant that I was still thinking inside the paradigm. As years went by, I've walked right away from that for a number of reasons. The first is that the GDP is a very pathological system. I mean, climate change now demonstrates to all of us how pathological it is. The pursuit of growth and development does not have uh, a cost side. This system of national accounts only has exchanges <coughs> in the accounts. You never ever take anything away for all the bad stuff that's going on. So, for example, devastating forests or wildlife habitats or anything else that is producing growth and development is great. Everybody thinks that's great. Motor vehicle accidents are great. Um, smoking cigarettes are fabulous. Uh, and um, so the, the, there's a very malevolent kind of value system going on. I think the four largest international trading groups these days are um, illegal munitions, uh, illegal drugs, illegal trafficking in people, and illegal pornography. These are vast, vast machines of exchange, and every one of them is great for growth. And they are all in the GDP. And there have always been ways to measure what is called the underground economy. And so illegal activities have always been framed on the right side, as it were, of the boundary of production. Um, every now and then, over the period of time since 1953, the extent of this has become clearly obvious in some wonderful five yearly upgrades. So when Italy wanted to have much better accounts to report to the EU, and then including mafia, drug trafficking, prostitution, etc., their GDP popped up by about 34%. Um, the Irish, of course, have got caught short with the tax havens that they've been providing, especially to Google, Twitter, um, etc. And they have now been slammed with billion dollar taxes from the EU. But at the same time, they had to make an adjustment in their GDP figures that popped them up about 40%. So one of the things that people always say about how important GDP is, is because they say, oh, well, it's very important to compare ourselves with other people. Well, nothing is comparable anymore, I promise you. Australia doesn't uh, uh, estimate its underground economy the same way as New Zealand does. Uh, when I was on the board of the Reserve Bank, and I challenged the governor and staff about the nature of the comparators that were being made. They were dismissive, but they went off and did the work. And so 12 months later, they published an article that said, 
New Zealand, because of these estimation and measurement difficulties, is generally pictured as running about 10% lower than the growth and development in the Australian economy. And that's important when you had somebody like Key running around venting this all the time, but nobody being able to challenge. Um, in uh, 2008, after the global financial crisis, finally, uh, Sarkozy um, asked Stieglitz, Fatusi and Amatya Sen, three Nobels, to discover what Waring had written about 30 years before <laughs> and, um, and to say something has to happen with GDP. Now let me quick, switch quickly to the OECD. There has always been a group of people in the OECD, Derek Blades I remember, uh, Lucella Clement Ferrard I remember, trying to measure unpaid work. To a very large extent, they were trying to measure it in terms of development assistance expenditures, right? Not in France, or for France, but wherever the development expenditure was going on, where there were huge subsistence markets that you might be interested in bringing to market, so you needed to estimate how big they were before French investors went running off there to try and effect that. <coughs> um, but so there's always been a, a little group pushing, and especially pushing for time use. New Zealand has had two time use surveys. The first was negotiated by Winston Peters in his very first coalition government. Um, I always thought he in that uh, particular election for that to be um, a cost saving for the national government when they wanted to do that. The best way of measuring unpaid work is through time use surveys. But there are quick and dirty ways of doing that, which is to ring you on the phone and ask you how much unpaid work you did yesterday and if it was for your family or your neighbour. Now, that you're, you, most of you are here because you're working in policy sectors, right, or delivering. Well, that doesn't actually give you the texture to make any decisions at all. Or some countries add some time use questions to the general social survey. This gets us along the road a little bit. But one of the things we notice when that happens is that men claim a lot more work than they ever did and women <laughs> underclaim because women are trying to think of unpaid work that they did when they were only doing unpaid work, right? As, a t as, a, as opposed to this constant simultaneity of activities that just goes on and on. So the best way and the most important policy information that we can ever have is the sophisticated time use surveys. And I argue very strongly for those in uh, Still Counting, the little publication that came out in December, um, because whatever, if we think in the context of the wellbeing budget, the wellbeing budget, right analysis, wrong solution. Right analysis in terms of, yes, have to move past GDP and have to move past per capita GDP as an indicator of well-being. It certainly isn't. Wrong solution? Definitely. The solution is to capitalise everything. So, and, and what's more, because it's driven by the OECD model, it's still all about comparing ourselves with everybody. Ha. Um, so, for example, when you look at the climate indicators that are in there, all the climate indicators are supposed to be expressed at national level. Right, well, New Zealand has 11 climatic zones. We have six really particular places in the South Island which we're greatly concerned about with air pollution. Frankly, even in a country as small as New Zealand, giving a national level of air pollution is a joke. If you could imagine what it might be like in Australia, it's an even bigger joke. 
Um, so there's a there's a kind of the patterning of the well-being alternative is not helpful to any of us. It's a, I've described it as a Eurocentric imposition of low-hanging fruit. Um, and yes, great that everybody's got on board what's wrong. And I am somewhat hopeful because regardless of the mechanics and the technical, how much is a friendship worth that's going on, in um, Treasury, if you are writing a budget to deliver, on to deliver on poverty, to deliver on children, to deliver on mental health, it's going to look more like a well-being budget anyway, right? Even if, and you're going to have more to deliver on climate change, etc. It's, it's going to have moved. It's going to shift in its nomenclature, in the, in the jargon that's used. But we must really be very careful because the paradigm which drives GDP is the paradigm driving treasury for social capital, environmental capital, and human capital, thank you very much. Which reminds me, human capital is awesome. Human capital arrives fully developed at the age of 15 and workforce ready. <laughs> and human capital is only ever about what the government paid for. So you'll be interested to know that there is no unpaid work uh, that is seen as an input or even as work into human capital. Um, there are, there are um, really great examples I could give you about um, work Julie Smith has done in Australia. So what does one new child in the household equal in terms of the hours of unpaid work? What does breastfeeding equal in terms of the hours of unpaid work? What does the multiplicity of tasks for women who are still in the paid workforce as well mean for her health? and her social well-being. See, these are the critical questions for me that underlie a well-being budget. Treasury is, when I say it, it's Eurocentric, by that I mean it's completely monocultural. The challenge group did try to draw Treasury's attention to Te Kupenga. Um, when I first arrived in the room, they hadn't even heard of it. Uh, some of you will know this is Maori um, written, Maori developed, Maori collection of Maori well-being, right? And in fact, and that's been done twice. It was even in the field last year when Treasury were going on about their monocultural well-being. Um, and what's more, there are some great questions in Te Kupinga that haven't been so solidly field tested actually are applicable to all of us, you know, about manaakitanga and whanangatanga, etc. So they're all great questions for all of us and they shouldn't just be <coughs> sitting there. But no, Treasury is not interested in uh, Te Kupinga and Māori defined well-being. Uh, similarly, cultural well-being doesn't get a look in, um, which is a, a huge consideration um, for many diverse peoples of New Zealand. And mostly people include, say, religion or spiritual connections under cultural capital. Um, and I, as a, um, as a long time agnostic, um, still think that I have very spiritual feelings <laughs> about the New Zealand environment. So even I can, I have no problem responding to that and to differentiating those kinds of contexts from other things. Um, now, what's the size of the economy we're talking about? So some of the most recent figures I have um, are the last, so Australia <coughs> attaches a time use survey to its general social survey. So it's not the best in the world, but it's not bad. Um, in Australia, 
the single largest sector in the economy is childcare. It's unpaid childcare. The second largest sector in the Australian economy is all the rest of unpaid work. <laughs> the third largest sector in the Australian economy is the largest sector in the market economy. So banking, insurances, uh, etc. In the UK, um, after Len Cook was our chief government statistician, he was then recruited by the UK and he took timely surveys with them to the UK and the UK has really stuck with them. In the UK, some of his work has uncovered, well, you, the, the, the uncovering is kind of devastating to know, but thank goodness they uncovered it because now we can do something about it. You know, so things like 20,000 children aged under 14 doing more 30 or more hours per week and caring for a dependent in their household or things like this. So actually getting underneath all of that means that you can respond to it. If you don't know, you can't. 2017, the Chief Statistician of the UK um, announced that all unpaid work in the UK was the equivalent of all manufacturing and retailing combined in the UK. And when the press said to him, well, why are you interested in this? He said, because I want to see a picture of the whole economy. How can we possibly proceed? Now, one of the reasons why time use is so important to me is because we can use all the, all the cliches we like about what the next 50 years might be like. 1953, we had this um, GDP scenario foisted on us. Whatever we replace it with, let's get real, right? We're gonna be stuck with it for 40 or 60 years. So we can't just be tutuing around the edges with this OECD wellbeing framework. Um, Lord knows what robots or automation or anything else is gonna make our work look like. Lord knows how long people will be living. Um, a very Tory woman walked up to me the other day and said, Marilyn, what do you think of universal basic income? And I looked at her and I said, well, at your age, and definitely at my age, I think we're both two of the 750,000 people who are already on one. <laughs> It's called national superannuation. <laughs> and so we have a very good background in New Zealand to determine how to expand UBIs when we need to and what people do when they're both in paid employment and receiving UBIs. And, and frankly, if we had time use surveys, we would be able to measure the conversation earlier, grandparents now looking after grandchildren, we'd be able to measure what I do think is probably a discernible move of some retired men, far more into the voluntary and community sector, um, even if they're just helping themselves, you know, they're out of mum's hair. And, <laughs> and um, so, so I, time is the only thing that can't change, right? Whatever's gonna be in the CPI can be meddled with by the Minister of Finance, you know, whatever the kind of benefit or other income or taxation activities are going to be, this can all be meddled with and all the indices can change, but time is not something that can change for anybody. So we don't just need it for unpaid work, we actually need it for the whole country, we need it for planning and it can't be the quick and dirty GSS approach. So what's coming in the wellbeing budget? Um, look, I really do think a, a kind of face, okay? My sense is actually that all the capitals won't have made much of a difference at all to what we get. We're told that we're allowed to come back and revise the capitals in 2001. Treasury says it's going to have another round of uh, to 20, 20, 21, thank you, um, going to have another round of consultation. But we've got a huge amount of growing up to do, right? We're not monocultural, let's get that really clear. 
um, when, this is not the time to just impose Western values yet again. Uh, one of the things that the early time use studies did demonstrate to us was that Maori men contributed more than any other cohort of men to voluntary and community work. So there's really important data in there for us to get in and under that. I think one of the only people I can remember ever using it was Trevor Mallard when he was Minister of Education and there were a whole lot of MPs getting very upset because boys were falling behind girls and he asked for the data and it showed that girls did more homework and he said, so? No. <laughs> right, what do you expect? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I want to give plenty of time for for questions and um, nobody asked for a deconstruction so I hope it's all been coherent and you've come with me and uh, I'd be delighted to respond. Fantastic. Um, and I'm just going to suggest something that you may or may not be into but I am anyway. I think we should sing for Marilyn um, because um, quite frankly you are awesome. Um, that, I don't, we're not going to sing the theme to the Lego movie which is everything is awesome. Um, but I would suggest for those of you who know it, Pudi Anae, if we could stand and sing Pudi Anae for Marilyn. Or you can just come along. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now Marilyn has to get away um, straight after this because she's completely booked up um, <laughs> during her time here in Wellington. So, um, well, I'll just ask you to raise your hands and I'll try and be fair in um, how we distribute the questions. Okay, so if, you, if people who want to ask a question, first off, put your hand up now and I'll just um, start taking order from there. And I'm just noticing that we have three men and no women raising their hands. <laughs> oh, so um, I would like... Okay, should we go with the three blokes in the... Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Right. All right, okay. So first the person to raise their hand was the man standing in the back. Um, and then we have... Um, lady in the red t-shirt. Yep. Yeah. The, um, you mentioned earlier, at the beginning before, that one of the solutions to improving GDP, if it's not in any way, was to capitalise on counter-spending capital. Is this, this an error? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, Yes, and that was, that was the error I made in my first judgment. So in the first edition of Counting for Nothing, as I was saying, because I was so desperate to make things visible, inside that system, I argued for monetizing both environmental services and unpaid work. And the more I got distance, I realized the fallibility of that approach and that it was a paradigm shift, actually, that was really needed. It wasn't like, let's just take it and mould it a little differently. So yes, I've moved right away from that. So how do we not, what do we do if we're not counting the spending? Well, you count time, right? First of all, like, I've got, GDP can keep going, it can just get over there in its corner <laughs> and stop trying to colonise everything else. New Zealand has very sophisticated uh, environmental characteristics which are regionalised and sometimes even right down to a particular lake or river, whatever. In 2002, when we had an amendment to the Local Government Act and local government were um, legislatively required to plan for environmental, economic, social and cultural well-being, uh, many 
local authorities embarked on really excellent work. I can, like Waikato Regional Council, because it's the old hometown, um, sticks out as one. Um, and what happens then, along with um, the, the values of other cultures, is that you're asking people to make decisions across a range of indicators. You're no longer pretending that you can just keep monetizing everything so that we all just come back to the old GDP exercise again and again and again. The truth is, whether we like them or hate them, whoever's sitting around a cabinet table is making decisions across a range of indicators. It won't matter what Treasury's just fed up. If they have a story about some autistic children in a particular classroom and a teacher who's a sister and they know how hard it is with the current ratio, that's what they'll argue, not what's in front of them, right? So, so it is always about making decisions across a range of indicators. And I think we just have to be brave enough to do that and transparent enough to do that too. It's a very democratic entry for the, all the population to take part. If I sit with the national income accounts and just GDP up in front of you all, some of you will truly glaze over and want to run screaming from the room. On the other hand, if what I put up are physical characteristics and time use and the kind of line items and the appropriations, you'll get very interested in the trade-offs. It's just a completely different approach to planning and thinking. Okay, um, Judy. Uh, yes, um, I'm afraid it is a sort of a GDP sort of question about how my generation is doing. Um, if all the work that is done by women is actually valued as if it was men's work, would we see a difference? Well, you use, you use the word value, so I'll just run with that. Um, no, no, because it, it, it's very important sometimes to unpack this stuff so that you know. Okay, there are three different ways of valuing unpaid work. One is just the replacement. So you, you take, what would this many hours of housekeeping, including all the different tasks, be worth? Um, the other is the replacement cost specific. So that means I've got one hour as a dietitian, one hour as a chef, one hour as a um, kitchen hand, you know, etc. So it immediately goes up. You can all see that. We, we're moving. The, the final option is if we said, if you weren't working full time in the economy and earning this in, sorry, if you weren't working full-time at home, and you were in the paid workforce, so this is what we call the opportunity cost, what would that be worth? And so that's the one that shoots the value of unpaid work up to 65% of the total value of GDP. Um, and mostly when you read OECD figures, or they're not using opportunity costs. They're somewhere around replacement costs usually in the early 50% of the whole economy. Right. Now, the next, so the, that for me, doing that is just a strategic tool to demonstrate that nobody would walk around and say, oh, let's leave energy and agriculture and transportation out because it's inconvenient, <laughs> right? Um, so it's, for me, it's a tool. It's like a strategic tool just to demonstrate how big it is. But it doesn't mean I believe in it, and it doesn't mean I think that's the route we should be going down. So it's to demonstrate how big it actually is. Um, what was the other thing I was gonna say about that? No, so I'll just stop that, okay? Yeah. Um, sorry for this little bit about a mean question, but um, you mentioned retired men and Maori men make up the biggest cohort of no, I was saying, I, I suspect, first of all, 
in the first two time use surveys that we did, Māori men contribute as a cohort group, contributed more to voluntary and community work than any other male cohort group. Um, with respect to retired men, what I was saying is I suspect if we did have time use surveys, that we would see um, some increase in the number of men receiving national superannuation who are now working in, voluntary and, in the voluntary and community sector. But at the moment, it's just a suspicion because none of us know. But when you talk around, you know, it's kind of the thing that you hear. So, um, yeah, so that's what those two were about. But so the first two time use surveys is where you can go to really start pulling some of that apart. Okay, now the woman who raised her hands, so I'm going, I'm doing the old gender thing. Yes, fantastic, and then we'll come back over here to you. Oh, I just, this follows on really, I just uh, wondered whether Steph can get us stop doing this time use survey and if there's any, if you know whether it's going to start. Okay, uh, the indications that we have from the Minister of Statistics before the <coughs> census issues <laughs> um, were that he was very, very keen on getting a time use up again and uh, in terms of the Treasury Challenge Group, it was the only win that we had that they then committed to. However, all of that was before we knew how much more we have to spend on the census, you know. Um, and and that's, uh, uh, but there's a message in that too, isn't there? Don't pick the cheapest offshore option. So, you know, yeah. Um, but at the moment, like, there is a commitment, whether there's resources, and there's an understanding as well. So this isn't just a, oh, let's shut them down, it's not too much, we'll do this. There's a real understanding about what it's for. Okay, we're going to go here, and then we're going here at the back, and then, yeah, yeah. To that way, Carolyn, it's a general question about the economic orthodoxy. What, well, how would you characterise the economics profession and that it's so slow to accommodate these, these shortfalls in their analyses? Um, because it takes them a long time to realise they're a social science. <laughs> <laughs> they are a social science. They are no more clinical, empirical, objective or anything else than sociology or psychology or anthropology. Mm -hmm. They always go hooting off to the business schools to pretend you see, that they're not a social science. And what it means is, you know, I, I think for New Zealanders, like I really, it's very difficult when you're an academic and you love the ology words because you love what they mean. So ontology, you know, like I was born in Ngārua here and I grew up in Tauperi. My whole lived childhood is about different value systems about different ways of being. I never expected that there was only one way of being because of where I grew up. So when I got to university and people started talking to me about ontologies and epistemologies, you know, how do you know what you know? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? And methodologies, I got that straight away and I had people around me five years later still floundering, you know, and it was like, let me take you home to Narawahia for a little while and you'll kind of get it. Um, economics has never got it like that. So in still counting, which is a, 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 I think if any of you have read it, you'll be able to see the suppressed energy, shall we call it, um, <laughs> that is on the page. Um, but it's just like uh, the impatience that I now have with this. How long? Do we have to go on being strangled by this all the time? It's just not fair, you know? I mean, it's not clever, it's not, as well as not being fair. You know, so much, I'm sure all of you will be recognising that so much of pay inequities spring from the inconvenience of unpaid work. You know, just so many people were doing it for nothing and so if you then introduce it to the wage labour force, you don't have to pay them much, do you? You know, and we're, we're still really 
chasing that. But yet, but that's that's the problem I have with economics. I think they'd be much healthier if they all had to come back and embrace the social sciences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, okay, it's a little like I responded to the gentleman with you, but so for GDP, instead of pretending that every transaction is good, I would have a three columns. I'd have goods, bads, and regrettables, you know, um, so that we didn't pretend that every market exchange was healthy for us. Okay, so that's what I'd do with GDP. I'd, and, and comparability over time, I'm, I'm fine with the Treasury, and the people who want to do that, and the politicians for whom that's the only thing that excites them, that that goes or oh, continues. I, th I see no reason to undermine that. And besides, um, with the changes coming, we're going to need to read the crashes and the booms and the whatever you know is going on there. So that's what I've got going on in that. At, but on the table at the same time, I have very textured time use data. Right. So. In, with very textured time use data, no one who, by way of a, a, a viral attack on the brain, who's going to be discharged from hospital, is going home until the home is completely resourced with paid people 24-7. All right? That's like, no. You can't discharge them to that. You're going to make three people sick in that household. Not one. You know, and besides... Even just a little conversation we're having very early. So much institutional memory is gone that people forget that in when the DPP was introduced in 1975, one of the group of people it covered was 24-7 carers of immediate household members. Right, and then the Ministry of Health has stood in the Court of Appeal several times and said, no, no, it's never happened. Um, so, so there's a lot, you know, we need to bring that with us. And also on the table, I will have all as much texture and detail as we can get on the physical aspects of the environment. And if necessary, you know, right at that town level or that particular river or etc. And one of the other things about that, just while I'm on it, um, that worries me very much about the OECD uh, um, characteristics, a real quick one, um, <laughs> uh, they, they don't have um, endangered species because there really aren't any left in Europe. Um, and, and that's very important to us, so, you know, that should be on. The other thing is that they don't do extraterritoriality. So the incredible um, change in the ice flows of Antarctica and um, the, the phenomenal loss of ice there, for example, immediately impacts on us, our agriculture, etc. So we can't be um, territorially confined either, right? So it's not just saying, okay, get the, the environmental characteristics on the table, so we can still measure them with the OECD, even if, you know, it's no, 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 I beg your pardon, <laughs> just forget the OECD. What do we need to know here, right? That's, the, that's what we collect taxpayers' revenue for here, not comparing ourselves with Korea or, you know, Norway. I just don't see the point. So, so and alongside that, we have Teku Pinga, this fabulous Teku Pinga, um, as a wellbeing survey. And alongside that, we have the kind, some of the kinds of, um, as I say, some of the kinds of questions that are in Te Kupinga that can easily translate to all of us. All of us. Yeah. 
So it's not having one single <laughs> monopolistic, siloed answer all the time. Thank you for your talk, Melanie. Um, um, I was concerned about you saying that, uh, that what's done now is going to affect our future for another 40 years and the changes that occur. When I read the text, we can go to court, I found they completely pushed the unpaid work issue to one side, which was hard basket. And then reading the WEAG report, which I confess I haven't quite finished yet, but um, it makes it quite clear that the beneficiaries mothers with children, they're going to be pushed into the workforce at the first possible stage. I'd like to hear your opinion on how this focus can be shifted by, um, you know, by respecting the value of the work of the unpaid. Totally. So in the final chapter of the little book, still counting, is called The Counterfactual. I had no idea what a counterfactual was until I ran into a public servant from Wellington who used it and I said, oh, what the God is that? It's a counterfactual. <laughs> so I thought, oh, okay. Okay, so there's a counterfactual. Um, and, and in terms of contribution to everything, I don't, I don't like to call it the economy, but in terms of contribution to well-being, from pregnancy, the biggest investment should be in any woman, right? For at least two years after the birth of the child. I, whatever is needed is needed. That's my argument, right? So it, it, there's, a, there's a, a political choice here, though, always. Um, and it was uh, always a very major discomfort for me in the party I stood for office in. Um, uh, you know, when you decide to resource well-being, you can either resource the services and make them all available, right? So no paramed women don't travel off to GPs and paramedics and everything if they're looking after a child. Everything comes to them, excuse me. And if they're not safe, we don't remove the child, we move both of you, right? And that, so. And, and that this is focused and concentrated for two years. And that, uh, so, you know, this is as far as I've got. I really need other people to, to work with me around this. But in my counterfactual, I've just labeled a whole lot of things. So one of the real key things that that means, I mean, I certainly had some certain instances in my mind as I was writing that, is that the child is never treated separately from the mother. It's just like kind of basic, really. Um, if the child is in trouble, the mother's in trouble, right? It's like, you don't have to be very bright to see this. So that's my, see, everything since probably 1986, um, because of the structure of GDP has been, the one way to consistently keep our GDP improving is to ensure women are in paid work. Does it even matter that they're at, no, it's the, it's the, for Australia, everybody will show you. That's the generator. If you take that away, you hardly get any growth. So it's imperative to keep getting more women into the paid workforce. That's what generates your increases in growth and GDP. Totally, but that's where, yeah, that's where all the policies have been, you know. Get, it to get, get the child to six months and it doesn't actually matter, you know, if you've got an autistic child or a child with some disability or something else, by God, woman, you better get off there into the paid workforce. And the work you're doing caring for this child is not as important value to us, the government and the revenue collectors, than you getting a wage and PAYE and GST and then we're happy, right? Well, this, this has to change. Just, so that's why I talk about a paradigm shift. And it's not just that women's unpaid work has supported the entire market economy, right? Now it's two lots of work that she's doing. This double bind, you know? Um, and the OECD, look, look, truly, the, well, I know we're nearly there, but when you read the OECD one, it's a friend of mine, Jewelry was reading Still Counting on the bus to Days Bay, she said. 
And she said she laughed out loud so many times everybody wanted to know what the book was. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that one of them would have been when the poor gentleman of the OECD wanted to ensure that nobody had to work more than 55 hours a week. <laughs> you know, and my solution was to lock them up for a weekend with three under five. <laughs> See how they felt about it after that. But no, I'm not talking incremental here. I'm not talking incremental. I'm not talking, oh, we'll just go this far. I'm talking, it's over, guys. You know, too late, too long. Whatever we're doing now is in for the next 50 years, and we're not going to be treated the same way again. Well, I don't know what to say after all that. <laughs> Thank you so much. You that can just was say, just... I'm in your army. Oh, I'm in your army. <laughs> And I think so is everybody here. Um, thank you so much for for the, you know giving up your time and coming here today and starting this debate with us. I'm sure your workplaces are going to be humming this afternoon. Um, but um, anyway, thank you so much. And um, what more can I say? Now I mean, you can say that Marilyn's, Marilyn's book books on sale outside. Um, <laughs> on sale about her political experiences. So. You can um, move out there and purchase that. Thank you so much um, for coming. Yeah. But thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. I am. Um,